let's take you through a journey of living to 100. Here's Jesse Gallen, age 109, and currently Scotland's oldest person. One of the very fun things I get to do is ask people, what are their secrets? So she said, my secret to a long life has been staying away from men. <laughs> they're just more trouble than they're worth. And I wish I could do that in a beautiful Scottish accent. I also make sure that I get plenty of exercise, eat a nice warm bowl of porridge every morning, and have never gotten married. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because a lot of people don't get married. Well, the women. The men are always married. We could get into that sometime. How old do all of you want to be? 60? 70? 90? 100? 110? Smokers, they think, well, at least I've met some smokers who've said, oh, I just want to live to 60. You know, I know this is going to kill me, but uh, I love smoking. And if anything is going to happen to me, I want it to just happen fast. The smoking will cause that, and that's what I want. Well, unfortunately, smoking causes COPD, lung cancer, emphysema, a few other things that mean a very long period of suffering and not doing so well. So there's a few different point of view. But if you're a birder, well, I need to live as long as I possibly can because I've got this long bird list. And I always, you know, I've got a friend who's got 4,000 different species on his list, another friend who's going on 500. Well, you've got to live a long time to accumulate a pretty good list. So that's, that could be motivation for some people. When you're thinking about how old you want to live to be, is it because you're scared of living to 100? Or do you want to start thinking about what are your dreams? What are your passions? What do you want to get out of life? And how much life do you need to do that? Now, there's a, little, there's a bunch of people that have some opinions about how long should we live? How long can we live? Now, there's a group of what I call uh, pessimists or purists and they think and I would say that it's founded on a bunch of uh, what I would call aging myths or what are called ageisms that people should die young what I call young which is your 70s this guy Ezekiel Manuel had a paper come out in Atlantic Monthly recently that was a big firestorm because he was saying I want to die in my 70s and it was, and then we had got Leon Cass, who was on the Presidential uh, Ethics Committee under George Bush, the uh, more recent, and who was also saying that mortality is our friend. People should die and get out, get out of the way of younger people. Older people are parasitic on our community. They cost a lot of money health-wise. They need to get out of the way. So I'm going to, hopefully, in the course of this talk, tell you why these guys are wrong. Then there's the realists or optimists. Jack LaLanne, I would guess most of you don't know who Jack LaLanne was, but he was a fitness guru in, on TV in the 70s and 80s, and he was all about getting people up off their rears and exercising and getting them excited about taking care of themselves and zest for life and aging well. Then there's these folks, instead of getting to your 90s, who claim that they can get you to 100 to 120, what I call the anti-aging quacks, or they call themselves anti-aging doctors, because they've got human growth hormone and testosterone and other anabolic steroids that are going to definitely stop and reverse your aging and get you to 100 or 120. Instead, what I call this stuff is toxic hormone soups. They have a lot of side effects. They don't do what these guys say they will do. It's just pure scam. And then we got these guys who say we're going to get you not on, maybe to 200, but maybe even 1,000 years. So Aubrey de Grey, the prophet-looking guy there with the beard, he says, you know, it's just a matter of getting rid of these six major mechanisms of aging. It's really pretty simple. And then we're going to get everybody to live to these very old ages. He thinks that if there's a person alive today, he's going to be a 1,000. To me, that's pretty much like saying we're going to build a space shuttle, put some people in it, and get them to land on Pluto. Now, 
I don't think, maybe Aubrey's met a 119 year old, like I'm going to show you, who's exceptionally rare. But I'm going to give you a story about just how complex this situation is. Now, if I'm saying we're not going to get you there, does that make me a pessimist? I'm going to show you why I'm a realist or an optimist. And I'm also going to say we may not be able to get you to 1,000, but I think we will be able pretty soon to come up for a way to stop or prevent Alzheimer's disease and other age-related diseases, and hopefully get a lot more people into their 80s or 90s and get delaying or even escaping age-related diseases. The other thing I would like to point out about this spectrum of opinions is how much money these things cost. So the purists are going to say, well, it's not going to cost anything. Well, I'm not sure. There's actually going to be quite a bit of cost to knocking off a lot of people in their 70s. The realist I'm going to show you is a relatively inexpensive strategy that's going to be very, very important, hopefully, if we do it. And the anti-aging quackery, that's very expensive. Costs you about $20,000 a year, and they want every penny of it. The futurists, well, now we're talking much, much more than like a, a moonshot, so to speak. And the question is, is whether all that money that they're talking about, whether it be for nanorobots, like what Ray Kurzweil says he has, that'll clean up your bloodstream and clean up your blood cells, and a lot of futuristic stuff. Aubrey has some pretty interesting ideas about interfering with some mechanisms of aging. But to do what he's talking about, might cost as much as a space shuttle going to the planet Pluto. Here's why I think I have a very optimistic view. And it's around the Seventh-day Adventists. This is a group that have a religion that dictates very healthy behaviors. And it's a very, a very heterogeneous group. They're from all over the world, different ethnicities. But here's what they have in common. They avoid red meat, pretty much a vegetarian diet. They eat in moderation. That is, they're usually not obese. They don't smoke. They don't drink alcohol. Although I'd say maybe a little alcohol is good for you. They exercise every day, and they emphasize time with family and religion, which may help them manage their stress well. And lo and behold, they have an average life expectancy of 88 years. That's about, well, now it's about 10 years more than the rest of us. But what's even more important than that is that they are compressing the time that they experience illnesses much more towards the end of their life. Okay, They're getting to these older ages because of healthy habits. And that's what gets them to 88 years. They're not getting older and sicker. It's not the older you get, the sicker you get. It's the older you get, the healthier you've been. If we could get our population to do what the Seventh-day Adventists would do, it would be the single most important public health intervention ever. Because if you think about it the other way around, what does it take to die in your 60s and 70s? Well, you smoke, you don't exercise, you get fat, you eat way too much red meat, you stress the heck out of yourself, which can be OK, but you need to manage it well. If you do all those things wrong, you die in your 60s and 70s. And you've got a very, very expensive group of people to take care of. They're in and out of the hospital. They're in intensive care units. They have a ton of chronic illness. Very expensive. The Seventh-day Adventists are not expensive to take care of, even though they're growing to be much older. Okay? This is what I want. This is what I, if I had my dream come true, this is what everybody in our country would do. I again want to emphasize that Seventh-day Adventists are a very heterogeneous group. Lots of different ethnicities all over the world. And what this group tells us, along with twin studies of um, identical twins reared together versus reared apart, and then looking at how old they live to be, that about 25% of how we age and how old we live to be around what generally we're capable of achieving is genetic. And that the vast majority of it is what we do in terms of our behaviors and in our environment. So again, the smoking or not, what have you. The vast majority of getting into your late 80s and the Seventh-day Adventists tell us that's the ages we should be able to reach. Not our 60s or 70s, but our late 80s. 
Okay. Now, if you want to live beyond 90, maybe get to 100, 105, then something else happens. And that's where I study centenarians. And this is uh, a kind of a uh, montage of uh, different centenarians in our study. Um, in the middle, actually, is a centenarian and her 75-year-old daughter. daughter. Doesn't look 75 to me. And it turns out that the kids of centenarians are also aging very slowly, even in their 70s and early 80s. They markedly delay. They have half the risk of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, hypertension compared to other people around the same, born around the same time. And they have about 30% less mortality rate. So they're definitely following in the footsteps of their parents. Now, people have a lot of things in common besides genes and families. You know, it's health behaviors, it's socioeconomic status, years of education. So I'm sure many of these other things are playing really important roles in getting people to these older ages. But I'm going to spin a story for you where we're seeing that genes start to play a pretty important role in getting to these oldest ages. So here's a picture of the lady in purple as our oldest ever subject. That's Sarah Knaus. She lived to be 119 and uh, actually was the second oldest ever person in the world. There's a lot of sensationalism around ages like this. You see in the paper all the time somebody living to 130 or 128. It turns out that about 99% of age claims beyond the 115 are false. And it's not to say people are lying through their teeth. There's all kinds of reasons you see these false ages. But with Sarah, we know she's the age in part because of this picture taken for Life magazine. Because sitting across from her is her 100-year-old daughter, Kitty. Okay, And then standing behind them is the 75-year-old grandson the 46-year-old great-granddaughter seated down below is the 24-year-old uh, great-great-granddaughter. And next to Sarah is the three-year-old great-great-great-grandson. So six living generations. And I've seen a few other six living generation families. And those were situations where you saw a tradition from one generation to the next of the mothers having kids at pretty young ages. And so that way, you could see a matriarch at, say, 106 with women all having kids at young ages. And then you get to have not only uh, six generations, but pretty big families, too. I remember a guy who had so many great grandkids, he couldn't remember their names. He just gave them numbers. He said, oh, you're number one, you're number three, whatever. It's pretty funny. This also, we've seen clustering for longevity, whether it be Sarah and her daughter Kitty. We've seen sib ships, where we see three or four siblings getting to very old age. These were all clues to us that these things can run pretty strongly in families. Another interesting thing about Sarah is if you look at Sarah when she was at 119, you know, how did she get there? And the thought is, is that these people have to age very slowly and avoid or delay age-related diseases that would otherwise kill you. Here's Sarah at 99. Now, I don't see a wrinkle on her, and she didn't have Botox either. Okay? And if you looked at her, would you suspect she's 99? I don't think so. And it really is a clue to us of just how incredibly slowly these people age. Here's a picture of Madame Kama. She was the oldest ever. She died at 122. She had this tremendous responsibility on her shoulders that every day she lived after I think it was about 118. She extended the human lifespan by a day. So eventually she did pass away at 122. And by the way, I think she smoked a cigarette a day. But she probably has some amazing genes that countered the effect of the smoking. And the Philip Morris company contacted me once because they said, oh, you're finding genes that people can have and they'll still smoke and be OK. And my dean said, well, let's really not go down that road. Here's Madame Kamal at 116, sitting bolt upright in a chair, looking totally engaged, completely cognitively intact. Now, she is what we call, and what Sarah, what we call, a supercentenarian. 
These are people who live to be 110 and older. They're very rare. They're about one per five million in the population. At any one time in the United States, there's about 60 or 70 of them. I do my best with my staff to find every one of them. There's about 300 of them worldwide at any one time. And one of the reasons that we want to find supercentenarians, and then these people called semi-supercentenarians, who are 105 to 109, about one per 200 to 500,000 of the population, is, is that we are finding genes that, or a genetic effect that is much stronger in these older ages than at younger ages. So to get to age 90, which is about 15th percentile of the population um, for women and about 5 percentile uh, for men, it's pretty common, actually. And it's pretty close to the average life expectancy, at least in terms of what you're able to achieve. But when you start getting to 100, and then even to 105, 110, that's where we really start to see a genetic component um, becoming more and more powerful. How do, we do, how do we know this? Well, we do some genetic studies where we actually find a whole bunch of genetic variants that they have in common much more than our controls. And as a group, if you had a pot of, the, of people just indiscriminately between centenarians and controls, I have a very high accuracy of finding these people if they're really, really old compared if they're in their 90s. So we think that, and also what this, these findings show is it isn't just one gene, one longevity enabling gene. It's many genetic variants that individually have very modest, tiny effects. But as a group, and there's, so far we're seeing about 200 of them, as a group they can have a very strong effect. And I liken this to winning the lottery. You know, if you, win two, if you guess two or three numbers, that's not such a big deal. And maybe you get into your 90s or a little later. But to get all seven numbers, that's very rare, and that's a big deal. And that's getting the right combination of the right genetic variants. And what's tricky for us is my combination could be different from your combination, your combination, your combination. Depends a bit on ethnicity, the environment that the ethnic group grew up in, uh, evolved in, and what forces were at play in terms of how old they got to be, or how old they got to reproduce to be. Um, at any rate, that's where we are now with these genetic variants, is finding these groups of variants, trying to understand the mechanisms that they play a role, that they uh, play a role in, in terms of how our cells function, and to try and then see how that might impact upon one's susceptibility for age-related diseases and how old they live to be. Now here's Walter Bruning. He's our oldest ever subject in the study. He lived to be 114 at the time. He was the oldest ever person in the world, oldest man in the world. He was completely cognitively intact. He talked my ear off for 90 minutes, never repeated himself once, absolutely did not have Alzheimer's disease. Don't let anyone ever tell you that Alzheimer's disease is inevitable with aging. We have about half of our centenarians, especially the younger ones, don't have it. The older ones, the ones who get to 105, 110, they, if they do get it, it's only at the very end of their lives. They compress their morbidity towards the very end of their lives, towards the limits of human lifespan. I was going to give a quote for Walter, just talking about how he thanked every day that he was alive. And that was a lot of days. 